Okay, one second. A very good evening to everybody and to all the guests who are joining us from other parts of the world. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to Speech Weaver's milestone meeting number 670. I warmly invite one and all to this fantastic meeting that lies ahead of us. I'd present my special welcome to our panel, uh, panel participants and our keynote speaker. Please let's give them all a big round of applause. Here at Speech Weavers, we provide a supportive and positive learning experience. Their members are empowered to develop communication and leadership qualities so that they help in getting back their self-confidence and enrich their personal growth. So let's move ahead into this meeting without mother, much delay. For that, I'd like to introduce to you all one of the special members of our club and the leader of the pack, who is the president of this club. Now, I had the privilege of meeting him last week. And must I say, he has that zest for life, which I always look forward to in people. He's a very young person, just 84 years old, but you cannot match his zest for life. I must tell you, I admire a lot of qualities for him. One of the things is when he sets eyes on something, he gets it done. And something that's something that we all can learn as leaders because we have to accomplish tasks at the end of the day. And as the leader of uh, Speech Weavers, he's been guiding us throughout this term and pushing us to get better every time. Please welcome our charming and most handsomely dressed president, Toastmaster Joseph Felix Benedict, with a big round of applause. Thank you, Toastmaster Deepa, for that amazing introduction with that great energy to start with. A warm welcome to my dear Toastmasters, distinguished Toastmasters, and honored guests. I welcome you for this Speech Rivers Milestone Meeting. In this Milestone Meeting, I also welcome the keynote speaker from Delhi and our panelists, Brahma Kumar Balakrishnan from Singapore, Manoharan Veera Permal, DTM from Telecom Malaysia, and our own division director designates Toastmaster Sauru from India. My warty welcome to one and all. I acknowledge the presence of our district director, Sanish Jahan. I declare the meeting number 670 in order. Build your confidence. You cannot take a big leap towards success unless you first take a small step to build your confidence, said Jill J. Johnson in one of her letters to the Toastmasters of International. She's the founder of Johnson Consultancy Services. The experience you gain in skills to a deep level of mastery, it does not happen overnight. With practice, you will build deeper awareness of yourself. You will develop greater confidence and demonstrate your emerging growth in mastering your new skill. Remember, Toastmasters is a platform where leaders are made. Therefore, it was my concerted effort to bring accredited speakers and great champions who in the long term Toastmaster journey achieve the place for themselves. They can provide you with new insights 
of possibilities that you may not have contemplated or considered. From the very day of my office as president, I have determined to bring these champions to inculcate their knowledge and experience in accomplishing our goals by listening to their discourses. Today, in our midst, a graduated student of psychology and management from Delhi University is a part of Toastmasters fraternity for over three years. In this span, she has held many leadership positions leading to the president of the club. She has represented her home club, Toastmasters Club of Speaking and Leadership at various areas and divisions levels to the evaluation of table topic contest. She secured first runner of position at District 41 Table Topic Contest 2021 and is a Triple Crown Awardee as well. Please join hands in welcoming with great applause Toastmaster Manya Jai Singhani. Over to you, Manya Jai Singhani. Thank you so much, Toastmaster Benedict. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can I tell a good evening? Good evening. If you can unmute yourself, I think good that's afternoon. enabled good for evening. all the participants. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Good afternoon. It's uh, it's good afternoon for some. It's good evening for some. And we are all in different time zones. But that's good the beauty morning. of Toastmasters for it brings us all under one roof together. Great. So I welcome you all to the session. And as it's as a keynote speaker is going to be my debut, because apart from that, I've taken sessions, taken training, but never been called as Toastmasters as a keynote speaker. So thank you so much, Toastmaster Joseph Felix Benedict, for giving me this opportunity to take on the stage on the milestone meeting that you are entrusting with me with this responsibility. So before we get started, let me lay down what are we going to do today. So before I get started with the traditional lay down of what I'm going to cover, let me start with an anecdote. So it was the year 2019. It was the month of October and I delivered my first ever Toastmaster of the Day session. And the theme was Dili Nama, I travel across the food culture of Delhi. So I told people about the food culture which was pervading in my home city, that is Delhi. And after that session, all the people just stand up and they gave me that feedback that Mania, I think that you are a milestone of content. We are here who just try to figure out content for a single speech, but you seem to be bubbling with the content each time. So what's that secret do you possess within? And after that meeting, my mentor also said that Mania, I think that Many Toastmasters might have the skill of oration, voice modulation, but content is one skill which you and I think you must share. And since 2019 to the year 2022, as I've traversed a journey of three years, I've completed my pathway in innovative planning level five, and I've completely tried to ensure that each and every speech I present has an innovative twist to it. So in the next 30 minutes, I will be spilling the beans of what all innovative strategies I have used in order to curate my content and present the speeches, Toastmasters of their sessions, because that's one of the most confusing areas of how to select a topic which baffles many Toastmasters till date. Are you all not confused with it? How many of you have faced this problem of choosing a speech content? Okay, Toastmaster Milind, I can see. Anyone else? Okay, I can see Toastmaster Adarsh. Okay. Okay, so I have two people who are not having this idea. Okay, I have Toastmaster Brahma Kumar DDM. All right. So I believe that I have a good audience who is all eyes and ears to me. But before we progress, can we have everyone on camera, please? Because I want this to be an interactive session because I'll be sharing the tips, but I will be asking you to give me an illustration of how you're going to use it because I need to know that you are actually learning something sitting on the other side of the screen. So Zoom Master, guest, Sakuntara, some person with P O C O X four two five G Arpit Maheshwari. He's from my, he's from my club. Geeta, ma'am, please come on camera. It would be good to have an engaging live conversation because uh, without the audience, it would just be, seem like I'm speaking to a blank screen. So it would be really nice if you can come on. Okay, I thank you, guest Sakuntala. Okay, backup event chair. So if you can also come, Toastmaster Sunil. Yeah. Okay. 
So till the time you uh, come on to camera, I'll just lay down the session progress. So I will be sharing seven crisp tips on how you can curate content. I will be giving you certain examples associated with each tip. And then after I'll be asking you certain questions about how you can also interpret and use that trip in your life. And lastly, I will be having additional 10 minutes wherein you can bombard, bombard me with your questions if you have any, and I'll be happy to address and take the session forward. So all set, hand, thumbs up if we can set. Yay. All right, so let's get started. So uh, before we progress, uh, another small tip from my end before you, it's like a pro tip I'm giving you. If you want, you can even take down certain notes because of course I'm not an as veteran distinguished Toastmaster, but I do have some capacity to share some tips which might come handy. So if you can have a pen and a paper to just keep on taking some small, small notes because I won't be sharing a PPT because I want you to focus here now and take down notes. So if you are truly into it, just say, make sure that you have all the equipments at hand. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Tip number one. So tip number one is really favorite, my personal favorite, and that is using our daily life experiences. So many times when those masters who are preparing for the icebreaker speeches come up to me and say, hey, Manya, what do we write in an icebreaker speech? And I tell them, so you have to write yourself, you have to introduce yourself, what your journey of life has been. But they say, no, we lead a very normal life, no normal childhood, normal college, normal job, and there is nothing abnormal about us. But speeches are not something always abnormality focused, right? We are all living a life 365 days multiplied by the years in which we are spent on this planet. So in my case, 365 into 21, you can translate how many days I spent. And each of these days has a story. And now let me give you an example of how you can do it. So firstly, everyday life experience. So can I have a volunteer to ask a few questions? I just want to ask a one question or two, if you can, if you're up for it, up for a challenge. So timer, okay, guess Santosh, okay, Santosh, unmute yourself. Okay, so Santosh, a quick question. Then, uh, yeah. what, uh, like today, what is one thing you are grateful for? Like what has happened new in your day and you are grateful for that? Yeah, today I am grateful because I woke up uh, exactly at the right time uh, that I have scheduled and I did my workout and uh, followed my routine and I uh, learned new thing. That's why I'm grateful for today. Yeah, in the morning, yeah. Before coming to office, I learned something new. That's why I'm grateful. That's nice. So waking up on time, getting on schedule and you know, Every second person, I believe, is struggling to get up on schedule. After eating atomic habits, we all just try to make and build small, small habits to get up on time and do something. And Santosh, I believe that you must have followed some regimen, noted down a schedule to bring that up in your schedule to how to wake up on time. Am I correct? Like, like proper regimen yeah. and planning. Yes? So maybe yes, you can yes. draft, why not draft a speech around how to draw a regimen to get up on time? Because there are many Toastmasters who just lie, lay down on bed late night, watch Netflix and are not true to the schedule. So maybe your personal anecdote might enlighten the audience here, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so you're on mute, I guess. You're on mute, Sandosh, if you're sharing something. That's yes, me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not. Okay. Yeah. I was also coming uh, struggling with the same issue. Uh, since a year, I get into this schedule and uh, following this path. Yeah, it's an amazing journey. Okay. So, see, you have a journey to share. So, even just, yeah. I just asked him one question like, what are you grateful for? And he had a story spanning over the years to tell us all. Isn't that amazing? Just one question you ask yourself at this very moment and you have this amount of data to set on stage, right? So now let me proceed to the second trick. Now, uh, this was about everyday life experiences and how you can use them to develop a speech. Second major technique we can use in daily life experiences is to maybe share a pattern of experiences which you observe. Now let me illustrate. So whenever I travel by metro to my college, I keep on looking outside the window, inside the metro, and I observe people. So while all the people are using their phones, I observe their behavior about how they are behaving. And this is the most humorous task to observe people by just standing. I sometimes I look out of the window, I see the slum areas, people running, 
see, and children rushing after the kites because the fifteenth uh, of August is coming up, and sometimes I see some people on the traffic, the traffic going on inside the metro. I see people only using their phone. Some ladies doing the makeup. Some gents having a call on their office phone. And this entire data, I collated it all into a humorous speech of me traveling in a metro because I observe certain things. So sometimes we observe certain patterns in our daily life, and it's always good if you can just keep on noting down these tiny, tiny occurrences, which can come handy while you're doing a table topic. Delivering a speech, or even preparing for a day or toastmaster of the day session. So, anyone in the audience who has certain unique experiences which you have come across in life, some tiny observance of either travel to college, study, anything, and you would like to share in line or two. Anyone in the audience? Yeah, okay. I'm quite surprised. No, I enjoy. People are so fond of taking selfies. And oh, sometimes that's the way they take selfies and the way they do and what action that itself is very humorous. It's Indeed, like a, a way they will change their facial expression, etc. So just observing them is a very entertaining process for me. Oh, that's the, that's a beautiful observation because see, you can even use this entire uh, observation you have with this. Like I studied in psychology, there's a syndrome called selfie syndrome where people are just focused upon themselves. And maybe by using this observation, you can connect this with an entirely new domain of introducing people to self selfie selfie like this, such as something. And maybe you can just develop on it, or maybe you can sort of report certain instances where people have died actually while taking the selfie. So uh -huh. that's yeah, so that's the unique elements which you can facilitate to add on this observation of yours. And as speeches are all just about your story, this story can be a good starting point in your speech. So maybe you have a second speech on selfie light, selfie if I'm correct, of naming that schedule. Oh, great, thanks. So I, and how do we proceed? Now, next question is how do we use these stories? So I personally maintain my own journal. I every day by, before going to bed, I take out 10 minutes from the schedule and tie down a diet of all the great things I'm grateful for. The lows, the highs, the success, the weaknesses, good, bad, everything goes into my diary. And some days when I just flip through this diary, I just get to have a memory taste back to the day when I failed, when I succeeded. And these are the stories I built for my speeches. And second thing which you can use on the spot is that a user story fire. We all have our gadgets, phones. Everyone is having a phone. Yes. So in phone, you have a note section. So name that section in a phone called a story fire. And the story fire is something wherein you can keep on noting down a few keywords or some instances which jump on to you when you're working, traveling, or anywhere. I got an idea for my idea for my international speech contest speech when I was exercising. So that was the time I just jotted down the idea in my phone quickly because I couldn't go back to my journal. So sometimes ideas just pop on to you and keep on storing them for later on. You do not know what comes to use. All right. So all set with the first tip of using daily life experiences. Okay. Santosh is saying a thumbs up. Anyone else? Are we all just listening or are we all interpreting this? Just master Milan is there. Gita Ma'am is also showing a thumbs up. Great. So I have my audience with me. Now let's go to the second tip. That is absorbing content from outside. Like how can we use some sources outside of ourselves to develop content for speeches? And the first thing, which is my personal favorite is reading books. How many of you read books? A quick question. Okay. Kita ma'am, Adarsh, Satosh, Sosma Samilindas. Oh, so many readers and bibliophiles in the room. Great. So how can we use books to read? So firstly, books can be divided into two sections, that is fictional and non-fictional. All right, so firstly, I'll say, I'll share about how to use fictional books. So recently, I was just reading this book called as The Forest of Enchantments. And it was a story of how Lord Goddess Sita is writing a Ramayana from her perspective. And that's a beautiful journal about how feminists views the entire journey of Ramayana. And from that book, people might say, oh, Manya, why are you reading this? What nonsense it is? It doesn't have any relevance for today. But on the contrary, I can use that content to analyze Ramayana from the, uh, from the feminist perspective of how different females have come to the foreplay to enact the entire Ramayana theme. 
I can use the uh, Dashrath's wife, Goddess Sita, Goddess Urmila, then I can use Raman's wife to analyze and see how women have shaped the narrative in their own. Had Lord Sita not been there, maybe we won't be having Ramayana today, isn't it? So that's how we can pick up the cues from non-fiction, from fiction books and deliver our content. So anyone who has read a fiction book recently from fiction journal, okay? Toastmaster Veera. So Toastmaster, would you like to share what which book you read? Maybe we can figure out what content can come out from there. Your fiction book? Uh, uh, the fiction book that I love to read is, is not fiction. Okay. And I like to write down is Mahabharata. Oh, wow. That's, that's nice. Okay. So any, uh, any character you relate with the most? Krishna. Oh, Lord Krishna. Okay. <laughs> that's so relatable because even I've been reading Mahabharata, watch Mahabharata on, on TV. And you can simply somehow share certain discourses from Gita by connecting to daily life experiences of people, maybe. So that can give the audience an insight into the nitty gritties and the tough content of Gita, which you have the access to and bring it simplistically to the audience who just cannot read because of the difficulty in language and different things. So maybe this fiction can be a part of your daily life experience and give the audience something to munch upon. Okay. Now, the second genre, that is self-help books. So how many of you read self-help books? Self-help books like Atomic Habits, okay, Santosh reads. Anyone else? Okay, Toastmaster Gita. Okay, Kesh from Makumar DTM, he also reads. So Gita ma'am, would you like to share which recent non-fiction book you read? Uh, you're on mute. Okay. Recently I read the 5 a.m. club by uh, Robin Sharma. I loved okay. it. That's nice. So what was the key takeaway from the book? The key takeaway was to get up early and to uh, fulfill your dreams, whatever be the age, whatever be the dream, you can fulfill it if you have time for yourself. And the best time is early. Nothing can be comparable to the early morning time. That's what Indeed. throughout it was. That's true. So how many of the audience have read this 5 a.m. club by Robin Sharma? Hmm. I don't see any hands. Okay, Santosh has read. Okay, so Geeta ma'am, you have such a good audience to share the summary of the book of 5 a.m. club with the members of the audience. Because no one, not all of us have the time, the capacity, the capability to read the entire book. But you, having been through the book, you can maybe share some key takeaways you gained from the book related how you followed that regimen in your timetable and inculcated the 5 a.m. getting up habit and maybe audience can get enlightened with your knowledge. And maybe that can be a source of sharing and content relating for the audience too. And in Toastmasters in Pathways, level two, project one is sharing by researching. The researching can be done with the help of a non-fictional book, a fictional book, and you can simply connect a story with that fiction or a non-fiction and present it to your audience. But mind that, don't just share what books write, because everyone can go and read a summary online. What I'm looking for in your content from an innovative edge is how you buy that content in your paradigm. What makes you choose that instant, choose that book over others. So add your flavor, give it your own spicy tarka before you present it to your audience. Notice? So this is how books can come handy. Now next step, and that is watching videos and Netflix. How many Netflix buffs in the room? People who love Netflix, see movies, watch TEDx videos. Okay, I have Toastmaster Umar Farooq in the room. Okay, just one. I'm bemused. Okay, distinguished Toastmaster Brahma Kumar. Okay, two people. So, distinguished Toastmaster Brahma Kumar, would you like to come on camera and unmute yourself and share which recent video or Netflix series you watched? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah. I normally watch TED Talks. Okay, TED Talks. Okay, so any particular genre in which you are interested, like psychology, happiness, or something of that sort. Amy Curie, have you heard of Amy Curie? Yeah, Amy Curie. Amy, Amy Cuddy, yeah, yeah, I've heard. Okay. It's about the power of postures. So she comes right. on a video as a Wonder Woman with her hands on the hip, at her, at her hips. And then she yeah. says that if you do that for 15 minutes before you yeah, start any speech, any interview, you will 
win the day. Yes. So I use that video normally to share with women to say that how you can build up your confidence at a professional level, because okay. women tend to have that. Of hmm. course, by society that also that you know, yes, that they are you know they are second to men. But she tells us that just throw that aside. Fifteen minutes, you put yourself in that power pose as Wonder Woman, or put your legs on top of the table, and then you do a presentation. Yeah, that's true. Will win over your. audience so videos like these are very useful for me that's audio. true so yeah tedx videos are a source of as a mine of content as those master uh, distinguished those master brahma kumar just said maybe he can share his knowledge of how standing like this for women can be beneficial and for budding women those masters this can be a really good learning experience and those master can enlighten us with his knowledge so many times these tedx videos just give us insight into what others have led in the life what success failures and experiences they have dealt with and come to what makes them today so i recently watched a netflix movie and netflix series and i might think that you must have heard that's called bridgerton so i'll just type in the chat box later on that's bridgerton so that series talks about its love story of course but people will say oh man why are you taking us in that genre altogether but that's not my motive that series is actually set in the time of british regency era wherein british used to have the royal family so the way the characters have the dialogue play it's very refined english so the good usages of words phrases and how indian royalty is different from british royalty can be exactly compared and contrasted at that point i was comparing how indian women used to dress when they were queens and kings and how british women used to dress in their croquet in their frocks and long dress so i have this mine of content ready if i have to deliver a team out speech on how western and indian cultures interact and are different from each other so even a single series tedx talks can take us a lot way ahead into what actually audience really wants and because everyone likes social media and netflix you can easily connect with your audience too but mind the fact don't just repeat what the netflix movie is all about or what tedx video tells add what you learned from it add what you gained and what you do like your audience to experience so that you can make your content innovative and give it your own twist all set so netflix done movies done books done and stories done now let's proceed to the third tip and that is using the current affairs so let me ask the audience which was the, which is the most hot news of the day which you have read today today newspaper anyone would like to share any headline top line side line okay those master million yes yeah india scored 16 zero against indonesia to qualify oh. for the next round in hockey asian games it was still yesterday oh. they had lost a couple of games and they were lower okay. in the line so only if japan pakistan lose to one japan and if we win by more than 15 goals in margin then only would we would have qualified for the next round and that's okay. what we did it was very surprising young indian team did that so they were very calculated and they in the last quarter they made six goals from 10 to and they just made 15 plus and that's all that was oh, the that's real nice. so a clap for team india for winning that because i wasn't aware about that about that piece of current affairs and trivia which is circulating recently okay so you just share about how team india is making and winning accolades to its hat adding feathers to its hat and taking the name of india forward so even this current affair even a smart headline can build a content now how like you just said like hockey it's like an underrated sport in india i don't see my school supporting hockey teams because we have badminton we have basketball we have football all the balls and games all the bats but never hockey so how can india's infrastructure support the build up of hockey and circulate this culture of building support for the game which is the national game of india can take us a long way forward So we're going to have fifteenth August meeting, and maybe there you can take a speech slot and talk about the national game, which is so underrated yet it is winning accolades for India because that recent Olympics. And today, as you said about this India winning a gig, I think we have a long way to go. And you can even carry a newspaper as a prop, show the current deadline, so people can believe that what you are saying is correct and take this innovative forward idea. Okay, so this is how even current affairs in a single headline can take it forward. Recently, today morning only, I read this newspaper about FMCG companies. Like FMCG companies are fast mover consuming goods, and they are saying that they are going under. Uh, they are not making profits because of they are selling one rupee sachets, like one rupee Clinic Plus, one rupee 
biology packet and they cannot reduce the quantity which is there in the packet anymore and i was just discussing this with my grandmother and she said mane you know even a single 1 rupee coin a 1 rupee coin and we used to get a week week full of vegetables for our home and today these people are craving about not filling 1 rupee in a clinic plus packet and i was baffled like how is even single coin used to get a baggage full of vegetables full of a family of 10 to 12 people so you've come a long way wherein even 7 to 800 to 1000 rupees need to be spent for getting the bag of vegetables and i believe that this is worth sharing with the audience about how the society has progressed from inflation today to the time when athanni and chavanni used to be used in north of india so i believe that current affairs can be a mine of contents for you to absorb and read editorials read the read what people have to say like recently we had the usa having bombarded people uh, children were shot with guns so at this point don't just read what happened read what people have to say about the policy what us government is doing to tackle it why can't it abolish the gun laws and enlighten your audience with the what you read that can be an immaculate source to make sure that your audience is hyper aware of what's happening got it so let's proceed with the fourth tip because we have absorbed content from outside sources we have dug within now let's see how toastmasters meeting and give your content surprise because we give content to toastmasters we see but how can we take away content from the meetings now let me tell you how so and that is table topics how many of you like table topic section or fear it the most okay adarsh so timer adarsh so do you fear the table topics or you love the table topics i actually don't see i actually don't fear anything to be honest but okay. of course all of us fear it at one point because it's one of those situations where you are posed a topic and you are asked to answer that on the spot and that can obviously yeah. make it very difficult for you but i think i have learned quite a lot at speech fevers and toastmasters <laughs> as a whole to become a good okay. table topic speaker i'm not the best but i'm more confident than com- <laughs> more, more confident compared to most so i handled pretty well but all the best to the others <laughs> Oh, that that's a nice perspective, and I'm glad that you are learning each day and are tapping to reviews. So, has it ever ever happened with you that after you've delivered a topic, when you're coming back to sit on your seat and are just putting yourself on un- un- mute, that you get an after-topic reflection? Had I said this, and this would have hit the bullseye. Ah, uh, definitely. Actually, there there have been many cases where I went back and thought about how I could have actually done better or spoke about a different experience altogether. And there were times where I actually fabricated my story or exaggerated it a bit, and I thought to myself, you know what? Maybe I should just—I could have just been genuine instead of just oh, yeah, exaggerating the story. So those are some of the things that I look back at. Yeah. So these are the after-topic regrets which stay with you till the time you go off to bed and into your dreams. And many times, what I have noticed in my personal experience are these regrets, reflections can be a topic for your next speech. So recently, if I got a topic in one of the Toastmasters meeting, and he said the table topic master said, "Make money your best friend." So I just cooked up a story. I spoke on it, but while I was going back on the seat, I got an after topic session. And just like others said, it is why it's after time that I could have added a fabric and I could have been more natural. And that was what the thought I had, because I said on stage when I was speaking that of course I deal with money, I save and save and stuff. So it was very bad. Now when I was going back, I got an idea. so money let's keep it aside but the topic focused on best friends so best friends are those who stay with you even when you're falling down right so many times we say keep money just like our relatives theek okay? hai like relatives who come to us when we just need them the most we keep them safe in bank stuffed up in the locker and keep on saving and saving the same thing why can't we make them the best friend who stay with us even when we rejoice so that we can spend fully and even when we are in distress and come to our rescue So make money your best friend. Invest in stock market. Invest in mutual funds wherein you are guaranteed a foolproof return. And don't invest in relatives who do not even care for you when they are you are in distress. So that was very stupid take of me. But I, if I could have said it, maybe I think people could have liked the innovative twist I could have given to the topic. And these after-topic reflection, just note them down in your diary. Make a Toastmasters diary if you need to, and keep on taking on notes. attempt the topic which others attempt and so that you can even have those topics noted down in your diary note down the topics which table topics master gives so that you have certain stimulants to give your response when you need one so these table topic sections can be a huge man a, a huge kind of a mine for content for you to absorb correct do we all agree for our after topic reflection 
agree disagree okay i have santosh appearing me a thumbs up so thumbs up flowing my way great now let's come to the next point and that is before i this uh, i share the next point i want you all to pick up your gadgets gadgets your phones everyone has phones i believe you okay adarsh is flashing those must be willing if you have any phone guess the kuntala if you have phone because i want you to use your phone it's quite contradictory i'm asking you to phone use phone in a bit of a meeting but i need you to so everyone has a phone okay i am on a phone some guest is riding great <laughs> i am sir if you if you are really keen to it maybe you can put your call on hold and do it okay you are joining the phone now open your gallery go to your gallery and open it and once you do start scrolling up like this scroll up do you see the pictures there indeed pictures videos selfies snapshots each and every picture you see is a story frozen in time the other day i was just scrolling through my gallery of one year back of how when covid opened up i was traveling on the countryside and the memories of that travel experience build up actually a speech each and every photo when you are licking on the ice cream when you went out with your friends a story is frozen in time just take out one story and start speaking about it when you open your social media instagram these stories are speaks a thousand words and thousand words is even surpassing the 5 to 7 minutes limit of the what 5 to 7 minutes speech can support so use this stories these pictures yesterday i had my toast master meeting and table topics master just brought out pictures as prompts for topics and i could realize that how powerful these pictures can get so use these stories to build your content and you can travel miles apart so before i proceed uh, adarsh can i take this 5 minutes more i'll just finish up with the last two tips because i think i believe i have the time till 40 okay thank you so much for that extra buff all right so stories from phone done i hope that gadgets are kept aside so you can show me your gadget and keep it aside because i need you to come back on stage great all right tip number 6 coming to the end that is talking with people we have 365 days in a year we have 5 to 700 friends on instagram on facebook on linkedin we have connection but how many people do we interact with here 4 5 how many friends you have like maximum short so let me ask adarsh do you have you are you there on instagram yes i am okay. okay how many connections and friends do you have i'm uh, not many to be honest because i've not been posting very regularly <laughs> <laughs> okay no just uh, just uh, give me a number number maybe i think it's 36 to be precise 36 okay. i believe yeah that's cool okay so 36 people which means that you have 36 connections whom you can interact and share your your private life and interact with people okay but many times what we have seen in my scenarios that people have boasting with 1000 2000 followers on instagram and then they ask them they say that they are really lonely they don't get to interact with so what basic point is that we don't interact and build connections we want to build connections only on screen but not in real life what recently i experienced was that uh, last year i went to a park and that time i saw a person a man an uncle i would say he was 70 years old and he was doing a headstand me being a 21 year old can't even attempt to just do the flip side of it and he was doing a headstand a 70 year old man and out of curiosity my dad a living example of motivation i didn't need books i didn't need any motivational quotes ted talks but just a living example and had i not interacted with that stranger maybe i didn't i couldn't have known the story today so instead of focusing upon your 1000 2000 100 followers bring and interact with people each day 365 days make 365 new connections and interact and see what people have you to offer when you travel interact with the locals eat local food branded restaurant and watching netflix in your hotel room won't fetch you much but actually interacting with people on the streets will take you longer forward well so how many of you are ready to forge new connections and talk to strangers 
talk to strangers not just stop anyone on midway but when you happen to come across a stranger of course great so i'm getting certain emojis and reactions i believe that to be an affirmative yes let's proceed now last point and that is divergent thinking thinking about the box beyond the box thinking like there is no box altogether in your step in your vicinity now let me ask you another quick question and this is going to be perhaps the last or second last like when i say valentine's day what's the picture that comes to your mind valentine's day anyone heart emojis happiness there's probably february 14 roses sorry roses uh, okay. Roses, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, just speak on. Unmute yourself and speak. Roses, everyone is saying roses. Uh, Valentine's Day, every day of your life, you love express your love. That is your Valentine's Day. Okay, that's true. So when I ever attend a Toastmaster meeting on Valentine's Day special, people talk about their interpersonal love, their romantic stories, and it's always a very cliched kind of a storytelling which happens. Nowadays, it's also about self love. But just think how you can innovatively give a twist to this topic of Valentine's. maybe we recently conducted a theme on which people just shared how uh, even objects can be expressed with love so we all we did the activity was that we had to write a love letter to our favorite non living object so i wrote it to my journal some people wrote it to the pen some people wrote it to their pet living for instance so there were different dimensions of love which people explored and this was possible because we were able to think beyond the common perception of love we were able to express love for work some people said they love their work their work is really really meaningful so even looking at work your passion what you wear your clothes express love with your clothes if you're not having clothes you won't be able to survive a day so every common thing in your room can be is worthy of the love and compassion so just think and share different different divergent thinking way of how you can bring forward your content look at it from a different angle altogether and how you can give that twist with your thinking now when you have a speech on leadership styles when it's level 3 you have to do, in level 2 i believe you have to share a speech about mentorship and leadership people will come and say leadership style one is autocratic authoritative directive democratic and list goes on but share your own story of being a leader you have your ec who is running the club toastmaster benedict as the president talk about his leadership style analyze a netflix leader you see and see and talk about the style to adapt talk about mentorship not just about mentor mentee relationship but also talk about what actually you have been a mentor or you have been coached by a mentor or have seen a mentor functioning in real or real life and this is how we can give a twist to a mundane topic with a huge variety of things so i believe i am done the red cards up the seven tips are done so if everyone can just shout out the seven tips i shared and my day will be made so what are the seven tips i just shared if you can just repeat it anyone can pop up one or one two three or five six seven yeah to osma samilan using your daily life experience number 1 okay that's great anyone else second tip so those of us who want every test I want to test the heart master limit of everyone yeah some social test the daily life stance yeah. check your table topics gallery table topics sorry this are guys some kon chalo check your gallery check your gallery those master geeta books read books okay five times so more to more left adarsh you also had something I think reading newspapers was also a part of it. I think that yeah, was. Yeah. And we also, I, yes, I have many other things in my mind. <laughs> okay, so I believe that we have all been um, having our cups floating with like it's like brimming with content now, and that was what I wanted to bring you. Your mind will be having certain ideas. So take out your story fire. Keep noting down the ideas. And lastly, I say, they say that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, but I say content is in the eye of the curator. be a curator and content will be yours over to those master milan or to smaladesh for facilitating the session here please give a great applause to those master mania taking the lead for the great speech of tremendous knowledge and confidence building is adorable and to hear from a mutilated experience in post master journey thank you so much and now we have the question and answer session yeah is there that... any... yeah so you can post your content in chat box and maybe one of you can read it or i can read it side by side 
so that we can proceed. So we will now proceed. So yes. The moderator is the entire corporate company secretary and member of the Chamber of Commerce Bangalore chapter and a practicing lawyer. He is also a marathon runner and a yoga practitioner. Let us welcome DTM Milan, sir, and the stage is yours. Thank you, Toastmaster of the day, Toastmaster Joseph Benedict. Now, I have to thank Mania for giving us seven jewels which we can use for a topic. So that was fantastically done. So now may I request my Zoom master to shoot out those questions to me if someone has already shared those questions to me so I can one by one take it over. In the meantime, since the questions are coming, so one thing is uh, normally in Toastmasters to make a topic interesting. Yeah, we have a content is there. They say something, you have to add some humor or something in that. And that becomes a challenge unless it's a humorous uh, speech, it's okay. Then it's mentally we are prepared. But nowadays we are seeing in anything, whether it's a table topic contest or even in international speech contest, they, they make sure there's a lot of humor content in that. And then they come to the main message. That's how they start. They make you laugh, they grab your attention, and then they give impart their messages. So that is what they do. So is there something while I, in adding to the topics which you are given, the seven topics are fantastic, the tips which you are given, where we can even have, have some humor content in that, especially then you are so experienced in humor contests. So if you can add something on that. Okay. So thank you so much, Toastmaster Milan. So you raised a pertinent question that's adding humor. So I would like to spill the beans again, but I haven't ever participated in a humorous speech because I did once. I came second in the club because I'm not a very humorous person. As for people see, I have red specs. I look very intimidating by my looks. So people can forgive me for that. So uh, my take on humor is that I'm not a humorous person, but I can keep my audience on hold without using humor by using other separate emotions as well. Of course, it's said that a story should be humorous above because making your audience smile is the best cause you can create. And if humor can come naturally in your speech, then it, it is an icing on the cake. However, I would I am not in favor of having fabricated humor inserted in your speech. So if you have the punches, which can be well uh, imposed and encrusted into your speech, then that's good. But don't add it for the sake of adding it. It should just flow in the speech. So once I delivered a speech and the topic was luck by chance, I was talking about my experience of how I landed in Toastmasters. I didn't even write a single sentence which was intended to be humorous, but I could see my la audience laughing at least four to five times in that meeting. So that means even the content itself becomes humorous by the way you present it. So it's not always about adding a special salt of humor. It has to come from within. Otherwise, don't add and spoil the box. That's what my take is. Thank you, Toastmaster Manya, for giving this important thing. So don't add for sake of adding. So you can't keep on spicing and think it will become too spicy and it will be tasteless mm -hmm. also. So that's a good thing. So something genuinely, if you add, and what you said with the punches and everything, the phrasing of the word, how you are delivering, mm -hmm. it may add some humor. So that's Indeed. also a very important thing. How yeah, you are one, delivering. One thing uh, maybe I can add is that you can use some uh, hyperboles, some similes, which uh, can add some effect to your speech. English has empowered uh, us with so many different, different euphemism, dysphemisms. Uh, and that can be used really well as powerful poses of rhetoric and stuff. Like, like we had seen a lot of uh, cricket commentators, commentators. Oh, the ball is going, 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 and it's going all exactly. the way to the sun or somewhere. So that way they just add this humor over there. Thank yeah. you for that. Exaggerations can be used. Exaggeration. So I have a question from distinguished Toastmaster Brahma Kumar. Yeah. How can we make our speech global, especially when we give it overseas? Okay. So uh, this is a very uh, good question because I've recently attended many IFP contests in my division, my area, and people just speak what they see in their locality. Of course, we need to use daily life experiences, which are really contextualized to our domain. But to make a speech global, you can eliminate those details which are very specific to you. 
For instance, if I tell you that I am a student of psychology studying at XYZ University in district Zilla in this and in city of this, so you might not relate with me because of course you are from a different city altogether. So for a global speech, which is there on ISC, seen on the world forums, use some topics which are well aware across the world. Of course, the topic like metropolitan, traveling in a metro, which I just shared, having hockey to get, hockey game in India, this can be a bit more localized. But for global things, I would suggest pick up those topics which you think that people can, of course, understand. And how you do that, maybe you can absorb content which in such like Netflix movies, which are seen across the globe. So this is some content which is being absorbed across the global people, anywhere in the world will have that access to it. And like it's in language English. First of all, you need to ensure that language is English and people can understand that. And secondly, talk about the topic which it is there in the current global news, not just current affairs in your country, but global news like USA having sh having shot seven uh, shot nineteen children down dead. It is a topic which can be heard across the globe. And then when you go for higher up in the ISC, you can pick up a topic like success, failures, and common themes which keep, keep coming up here and there, and you will have your global appeal. Just eliminate the details which limit you to your pertinent area. That's what I believe. Thank you, Toastmaster Mania, for highlighting this important thing. So you have to be conscious of your audience, and based mm -hmm. on the audience, you have to cater your cuisines accordingly. That's a good thing. Yeah. Just different for different. Yeah. yeah, sorry, you're saying something. No, no, I was just saying like, like different countries are different clothes. You have to just wear jeans and jeans and how which can be accepted in most of the cultures. So play safe whenever you go for a global yeah, yeah. Good, good. The next question is from Postmaster Adarsh. How to find connect content to make speeches more humorous? I think you addressed that or you want to add something? Uh, I think that I've addressed that to the fact. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what. Yeah, yeah. So already, maybe, that was, I think we both had, Adarsh and me had the same question. Yeah, yeah. Humor, oh, okay. I think with, it's gained with practice because there are different genres of humor which even use different uh, canons of humor takes, which you can learn, of course, and even I'm learning at it. So I may not be the correct person to approach for humorous topics, maybe. <laughs> but I can definitely tell you how to spice it up. Good, good. Now there's a question from our guest, Santosh. Yeah. How to find contents to make speech more... Uh, no, that's the uh, same thing you say. Okay. Uh, so there's one. Uh, so there's from our guest. There's one question. When I write a speech, my opening is great. The body of the speech is full of good content. But please help me. How should I powerfully conclude my speech? I struggle with the conclusion. Okay. All right. So uh, when I say a speech, a speech is not just a mixture of your vocal variety with words. It is like a travel journey, which I perceive. So you have a destination where you start, you travel across the way, and then you reach the destination. You have something to reach to. So whenever you have the conclusion, not just conclusion, your entire speech should be structured around that one, like uh, like just examine a wheel. It has a, it has a cog in the end and the spokes in all the direction. Each and every sentence you speak on your speech should be linked to that conclusion. And if your entire speech is linked to that entire crust and the entire core of that speech, I think that even conclusion can be exactly drawn from there. So for channeling and conclusion, I believe personally that I give a global take -off. Like in, uh, if I share about a topic which I shared recently, uh, to give an example was say luck by chance, which I gave a speech on how I joined Toastmasters. I asked people like how lucky they think they were. So people initially said that, yes, they all were lucky. They somewhere said they're not lucky. By the end, I repeated my question and asked them, do you think you are lucky? And they said, yes. That meant that in the body, I we helped them reach that conclusion. So conclusion can be a question which can prove that audience have actually understood that what you were trying to convey. Secondly, it can be a message for the society at large to take away. And like in one sentence, it should be given. Sometimes your topic can be a conclusion. I recently gave my I, uh, ISC speech. It was on misfit. It was on body image issues. And it was titled M-I-S-F-I-T. Misfit means someone who is not fit into the society. So I believe that everyone deals with body image issue, height, weight, and stuff. And by the end, in conclusion, I link back to my topic. When you said you have a good opening, I was saying that came mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the best of them all? There is no one best. There is always misfit. But in the end, I said, we are all misfits. So miss was M I W S and the end was F I T. So miss fit. It's a completely different uh, interpretation of the topic. 
because the body was structured around that one cog of the wheel and that was body image so conclusion can flow from the speech and give a global appeal in just one sentence one question or one remark that is, i usually believe it does because conclusion really flows from the body thank you that's very important because like when we used to have in as a kid we used to have stories and there's to be end moral of the story so something yeah. of that conclusion is that so we have to focus yeah. on that's our destination and to spice on that we are justifying with various experience yeah. of yours to connect it because more personal with you and when it becomes personal with you the audience also gets exactly. connected and then they appreciate why you are coming yeah. to that even uh, i have one question yeah, just yeah, one thing i would like to add is that this came to mind i've seen many ic speeches at world forum people sing along the conclusion like they have the That's topic true. so famous that people tend to repeat with you So if that's the thing when it's happening in your body, maybe conclusion can be an easy go for you. Yeah, so that's yeah. a, that's a very really powerful thing. One point which I have, this is the last point, which is the divergent thinking. Yeah. So you, okay. so for first six, you nicely elaborated. The moment the seventh came and the time was put the red yeah, card yeah, in the yeah. screen. So can you mm-hmm. elaborate a bit of what is this divergent? Suddenly it's same up to yeah, yeah. out of tune. <laughs> so just can yeah, you yeah. elaborate okay. a bit with examples? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So divergent thinking means like in psychology, I studied this concept of divergent thinking. One way is to solve a problem as it's being done, and other way to solve a problem is to look at it from a creative mindset. So that's what diverge means. So converge means you converge to a point, and diverge means you just spread out your rays, just like sun does. It spreads out its rays in all the directions, and that's what I indicated by divergent thinking. So divergent thinking means like looking at beyond the connection. so i usually use this divergent thinking concept when i take table topics training so this means i like just in a state you with the help of table topics now so let's take the example i use in the topic of uh, uh when money as your best friend so this money as your best friend now most of the people will be thinking let uh, money should be spent judiciously money should be kept safe money should be just done in this and that format however i would suggest a different approach to it from a divergent perspective that in the topic we have two different poles like money and best friend so evaluate money first that's two like this like two pillars and they are being joined together money and best friend so first pillar you evaluate first like what is money money can be dollars money can be rupees money can be any currency what are uh, what are your best friends best friends are people who stay with you forever best friends are people who are stay with you when you are falling down going up and then when you have evaluated these both connections you connect them with the help of a bridge that is how to stock market do this thing do that thing and this can be a connection between two divergently elaborated poles so it means looking at uh, normal things from a different lens altogether uh, if i would give you another example i would say there's a topic that everything that shines is not gold okay everything that shines is not gold now you will take of course that everything which looks fancy is not good that's the correct in- interpretation but i can look at from a different lens that is ela- elaborate on the word shine shine sparkle glitter which fades away with time but gold is one which has its value same whenever you touch them you can even sell them at double price when you purchase them so it's different from shining and gold so connect them that uh, with the help of maybe food fast food is just like glitter it's fine it elaborate it gets your attention but good food is just like gold it builds your body and saves you and food can be a connection so it's like differently observing both these ends and looking at it from a different angle so i believe that illustration must have been quite thank a good thank you time. for this for this great clarity which you have given so with this uh, ladies and gentlemen we are forced to conclude this per question and answer session because we have a fantastic panelist who are waiting to go and there are other questions that are still pending so please oh. reach out to our keynote speaker one to one and she will definitely answer your queries mm-hmm. so with this and th- let's give a lot of applause to our keynote speaker and over to the event chair toast master president uh, joseph benedict you are mute joseph sir mute. yes Thank you, DK Milanji, for conducting this session with so much of enthusiasm, and also 
the question and also answers are really enriching our mind during that session. Now it is time for us to go for our second se session called panel discussion. In this session, we are the following panelists. Two are from overseas, that is Singapore and Malaysia, and one is from India. Deacon Brahma Kumar Balakrishnan from Singapore. Organized the 12 hour, six country table topic marathon in 21 August 2021. Completed five pathways, completed the 90 day public speaking video challenge. Uploaded 180 motivational videos in YouTube channel called Motivational Thoughts. Has won trophies at the area and division level contest. Visited over 40 overseas post masters club. Area director viewers in District 80. Tamil Translation Reviewer has three DTMs to his credit. The second panelist is DTM Manoharan Veera Perumal. Postmaster from Ponsa Telcon Malaysia Toastmaster Club. Charter President of Shah Alam Toastmasters Club 1997, which regularly achieves President Distinguished Status. Past President of Mahakavi Tamil Toastmaster Club, currently District Director, Area 3, District 102. Lifelong learner, entrepreneur, and investor. Impassional meditation practice for two decades. Now, coming to our Toastmaster, Saurabh Dutta. He was Toastmaster since 2020, President and past VP of the Gabby's Toastmaster Club, Bangalore. VP Education of Rising Speakers Toastmaster Club Bangalore, Area Director, Area B3, District 92, Division Director Designate, Division B, District 92, Winner of Four Pathbreaker Awards and Pathways Mentor Program Award, including Fastest Path Completion in District 92 in 27 days. Winner of Two Triple Crowns, Winner of Outstanding Toastmaster and Blanchard Master Award, from Toastmaster District 92. Once again, a warm welcome to all these panel this panelists. The today's topic for panel discussion is, it's a very interesting one for everyone. Are Indians losing their culture identity? I repeat, are Indians losing their culture identity? Now each panelist will be given two different questions in each turn and a common question will be asked for all the three panelists. The first question to DTM Brahma Kumar. To what extent Western culture is affecting Indian culture? Over to you, DTM Brahma Kumar. Can you hear me? And am I visible? Yeah. Yes. Now let me just give you a cultural context about Singapore. Singapore is a country with 3.5 million citizens with 7.4% of them being Indians, according to the Department of Statistics from Singapore. When Singapore got its independence from the British and was separated from Malaysia in 1965, we had a challenge because we had a country with multiracial people of the Chinese, Malay, and Indian races. So the, then the, the Prime Minister, the late Mr. Kuan Yu, and his cabinet decided that Singapore should follow a policy of bilingualism. What that meant is that all of us will learn English as a language and our mother tongues, namely Malay, Chinese or, Indi or Tamil to represent the different ethnic communities. What this policy of bilingualism had ensured then and now is that Singapore is able to protect its cultural ethnic traditions became a cultural balas while creating a common space to unite all the races. So in this context, when we look at Singapore, if you ask the question, to what extent is Western culture influencing Indian culture tremendously? We have to learn many things through the English language. The English language is language globally spoken among non-native speakers throughout the world. 
46 different countries. The advantage is that many of our cultural heritage has been translated into the English language. Now, if we look at each of our ethnic groups in India itself, we have the Telugu, the Tamil, the Kannada, the Malayalis, the Bengalis, the Sikhs, the Punjabis, and so on. India itself has about 22 different languages and many dialects, 22 officially recognized languages and many other languages and dialects. But when we learn it through English, I'm able to understand a culture that is peculiar to the Malayalis, peculiar to the North Indians and so on. So in that way, we have an advantage. Yes, English is everywhere and we are learning many things through the Indian culture, through English. But let me ask you, how many of us have listened to the song? Why this collaborate, collaborate, collaborate? How many of us have listened to that? Many of us. Some of us don't even understand the language, right? Because it's half Tamil and half English. So you get uh, of knowledge only, you can say, if you don't know the language or if you don't want to know the language. But you also look at it another way. Isn't that a good way of our language, our culture being shared with others across the globe? That's the advantage we have. When we listen open Gangnam style, again, it's not Indian, it's Korean. But all of us dance to that tune because there's something that we like about it. Except we don't know how to say what it is. That's the advantage. So culturally, we have no choice. If you look at food, in Singapore, how does food take place? Most of us, because we are working, and in Singapore, many women go to work, we eat out. Fast food is very common fast food. But then, today, many people bring food from home. What does that say? That our Indian food has something in it that we all love. It's spicy and rich in flavor. I recently had some of my Chinese ask, colleagues asking me, can you tell me a good place where I can go and buy appam? I'm sure some of you know what is appam, right? It's like a pancake, South Indian pancake. So that's the amount of uh, influence in Indian culture has. Talking about prata and roti chanai, as it's said in Malaysia, that's very popular. Many races in Singapore go for the food. So there is still our Indian touch here and there. When you talk about movies, apart from Hollywood movies, what else do we watch? Definitely, it's either a Bollywood, Hollywood, or Tollywood movie. And would you believe it was my Myanmar neighbor who came and told me, go and watch this movie called Bahubali. And that's when I watched it in Tamil. Later, I realized it was in Tamil, Malayalam, Telugu, and how many other languages dubbed it. That's how international that, lang that movie has become. Because people want to see what is good and what is current. Uh, I hand you back uh, to Mr. Thank you, D.K. Brahmakumar. You have given a representation of how the English language affects our culture, without which we cannot move further. That's one thing. And second thing about giving us our culture to the Western culture by learning that language so that they, we can be able to uh, share our culture with the Westerners. And also the food, which is also one of the things that we share each other, no matter what the culture is. It is uh, coming from the taste. Even Queen Elizabeth was having rasam on her table from Venkata Chalam company from Hyderabad. That was the brilliant uh, the thing one can imagine. It goes to the Queen's table. Now, the your first question to DTM Manoharan. His Western culture is destroying the Indian culture and its tradition. His Western culture is destroying the Indian culture and its tradition. Over to you, DTM Manoharan. Thank you, Ivan Chair Joseph. Manakam. Before I gush about our Indian culture and tradition, allow me to share something about Malaysia's take 
on Indian culture and tradition. Our breakdown of Malaysian is 62% Malay, Malay, Malay and 32% Chinese and 6.5% Indians and the others are other ethnics. So out of the 6.5% Indians, 80%, 80 to 85% is from South India. So the pre, the dominant race in Malaysia is Tamilians. At the same time, our brothers, we have Indians, when we talk about Indians, we have Telugus, we have Singhalese, we have six. All, the, all of our people are proud of our tradition. How do we practice our, this tradition and culture here? We have awesome temples, cultural centers. We have Tamil schools. And the mother tongue is practiced in their own houses. Many of them practice their mother tongue. And if you answer this question, Is Western culture destroying the Indian culture and tradition? Please allow me to share my thinking on this. How can our Indian culture and tradition be destroyed? It is one of the oldest tradition. Even, even I'm so proud of our tradition. This tradition just did not just come to Malaysia now. It was been there for ages. When the kings, Chola, Raja Raja Cholan, Vijaya Empire were the dominant uh, culture, and we have built temples that are still there. And why are we making the rest the boogeyman? Why I see in our country itself, we have disagreement, and we are so scared of our own culture. We have, for example, we have embraced our language and we were very proud of it. And we have Tamil Toastmasters. I've been very active in the English Toastmasters. Just recently, I joined the Tamil Toastmasters and so proud. And when we are discussing, sometimes the enemy is not out there. Enemy within. Why I say within the Indian context, Indian culture. When, for example, when I say, okay, uh, Brahma Kumar Ji or Saurav Dutta Ji. You see, Ji is not a Tamil word. It is a Korean, not Indian word. We shouldn't be using this word. And they say, you use Manosar, okay. Brahma Kumar, sir, okay. Sir is an English word. It's a Western culture. So in that aspect, what am I, what am I trying to convey here is, our culture, Indian culture, is so vast, so beautiful, so majestic. It cannot be destroyed by any other outsiders. Definitely not the West. It comes and goes. Of course, in Malaysia, we love, Malaysians love this Roti Chanai, which is from India or the Barata. We call it Roti Chanai and we say this is the favorite food of Malaysian. And we Malaysians, we converge in this, we call it Mama. Mama meaning Indian Muslim restaurant, where all the races, they come, they take their, we call it tetare or pulled tea. And this is a tradition and that is embraced by everyone in Malaysia. It's something like somewhere where we go, come, we go for roti chanai and tetare. This is something of Indian, which we have embraced and we have we are fully involved in it. And is the West destroying our culture? How can it be destroyed? It as our Indian culture tradition is continuously evolving. And it is something that is something that we should be proud of and we continue to embrace. And, and for example, my children, they speak in our language, Tamil, we talk our traditional, our mother tongue. And I can see that when we have a cultural event, when we have this festival, all these people come, converge together. You should come to Patike. 
in in Malaysia, in one of our capital, and where we see that there is a, is the culture, the Indian culture, or the, the festival is celebrated and all the races come and it is a major event promoted by the government because this is where we can get overseas people coming and seeing the Indian culture in our country. So answer the question. Indian culture and tradition, they will be up and down like fashion, but it will cannot be destroyed by no other people unless we allow it. And we definitely will not allow it. Over to you, panel, even Chair Joseph. Thank you very much, Mr. D.K. Manoharan. Now prove that our Indian culture cannot be lost by any influence of Western culture. And moreover, we are always following right from home to anywhere, even to the festival, our Indian culture is not lost. That is what I can infer from your speech. Thank you so much. Now the other first question to Toastmaster Saurav Dutta. What is so wrong about Westernization? Why do Indians blame the Western culture? Over to you, Toastmaster Saurav Dutta. Shall I repeat the question? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Am I audible? So there's a saying which says that when ideas fail, people invent words. When ideas fail, people invent words. So I would say blaming someone else for our own shortcomings, that's the easiest way of getting out of it. And I think that's something that we have got um, a significant amount of mastery. Um, for 70 years after independence, uh, we still keep on blaming everything that's bad to the colonial hangover. Uh, we feel that the British came and, uh, you know, ruined whatever great we had, that we had many years to rebuild it. That's something that, uh, that's something that we very conveniently forget. For all the failures that we have in 2022, we still go back in time to find someone to blame in 1947. Right? So I'm not saying that anyone was perfect. This is not a political discourse. I'm not a fan of this side or that side, the right or the left or the center or whatever you want to call it. But the fact is that the easiest way of getting out of a tight situation is to find someone to put a blame on and run away from it. Ask any husband in this room, they would know. We have all gone through that situation, right? So the same thing happens for as a, as a nation as well. When we feel that there are certain things that we cannot do, we try to find someone saying that this is the reason that things are not happening. One thing that we need to understand is that the definition of culture, when we talk about culture, this is my perspective. I'm not an expert in culture. I've not studied culture as my PhD. But this is based on my interaction with a lot of people from different cultures because I've traveled all across the world um, in, to Europe, to, to US, to various parts of Asia. And I've interacted with a lot of people from various days because of my, um, you know, because of my work commitments and all that. One thing that I've realized is that when we talk about culture, what are the some things that immediately come to our mind? Food, clothing, festivals, religion, and so on. But if you look at, if you do a little bit of research, you'll see that the, the most important manifestation of the foundation of culture is the sense of self and society. The sense of self and society is what defines a culture. And the rest of the things that we see in terms of what we wear, how we, uh, you know, uh, how we come across in terms of our festivals, what we eat and all of that, more than culture or along with culture, there are a lot of other things like, for example, the climate, the top, for example, in India, we eat certain kind of food, which we don't eat in the West because of climate could be one reason, the kind of clothes we wear. There also there is a little bit of climate effect because of which we wear certain kind of clothes. So everything cannot be put in culture that I wear a dhoti because I'm mean Indian. It's not like that. It was like Indians used to wear dhoti because of the tropical climate that they were in. So some of those realities we need to sink in that these things are more of a manifestation of the cultural belonging rather than the, the foundation of it. So cultural difference is not about what kind of songs I sing or what kind of poetry I read. Cultural difference comes from the fact that what is my sense of self and society. So this is something that we need to understand. And once we start appreciating that, then we will stop put, pinning the blame on other people saying that you are the responsible for wherever I'm standing today. I think uh, we as a nation have to uh, take ownership of whatever uh, failures we have because we very proudly go about claiming success for everything that's happening across the world, right? So uh, I'm not denying that we have a very rich legacy, 
but at the same time very we are very quick in taking credit and we are very quick in discrediting uh, anything that's not working fine so the, so while it's true that the zero was invented by an indian and we take great pride in saying that it's also true there's a lot of other things that we have done which we are not really proud of and when it, that happens we say okay it was not me it was you know the british who has taught us okay so so let's that, that that's one mindset that i think we have to get out of and the other uh, and part of that what happens is um, and that's why you know across the world uh, there is a there is a feeling that the indians are have this thing about being argumentative whenever you put a point across whether you have a data whether you don't have a data uh, you would always have a point of view um, i'm from calcutta and in calcutta if you go to any tea shop any tea shop anyone right you'll find one economist one politician one historian and uh, you know sitting there and having a very heated debate about why russia attacked ukraine and what all can go wrong and what should vladimir putin should have been doing and and why is us uh, silent on this and they have a whole lot of theory around this with a lot of facts and figures all of that is just bogus so wh- so what 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 is exactly happening here people are just whiling away their time doing nothing and and trying to find an excuse and then they go back home and say okay i don't have a job because you know mamta banerji is not creating jobs or modi has uh, screwed up the economy what's the real reason you're not putting in the effort so i think some of these things we need to have some kind of a self realization i for one don't blame anyone for anything that's happening in our country apart from the things that we are doing ourselves we get the government we deserve we get the politics that we have voted for we get the economy that we are working for so yeah the british have done what they had to do now i'll start turn to work on it over to I you i want to say that you are rightly said about the the uh, cultural differences depending upon the climate condition and the food that we eat and all it is really uh, understand one has to understand and if you say that if you if you know english and french you can go around the world talking to everyone that is what i heard right from my childhood so if you see the saudi arabia Nobody wears suits there because of the climatic condition. They all have a white robe, but the white, not color, because it reflects the heat. So that is the understanding. Now, to sum up, all the three speakers have spoken about food, way of life, religious, uh, uh, religious, and uh, other celebrations. all these things will still stand worth doing in our own indian culture that doesn't damage from the western culture that is the end of the uh, debate that for the first question now let me come to the second question the second question to dtm manav uh, toastmaster joseph are we in uh, pardon yeah joseph sir i have a question before we go ahead as a timer i would like to know how many questions we have i think i was so we have a total of six questions so if you have six, yes. so each speaker will have around two two questions each or will each speaker have to answer six questions each no what no i am coming to the second round all right the second round in that case i think we can go ahead with the same timing protocol that i provide we can go ahead. losing our culture and values in the name of liberty and modernization over to you dtm manohar thank you you mentioned when we talk about youth uh, and we talk about liberty and modernization uh, i don't want to stereotype stereotype the youths because we have innovative divergent speakers and thinkers like manya who chat with us so when we talk about youth they are embracing this liberty and modernization so in this culture that we have i will my father's culture as an indian what he says i must follow i tell you do and there is no debate yes that whether right or wrong and then my brother followed the tradition when i was a elder brother to my bro- younger brother i say you do this you would follow but later now my children who are all adults teenagers and adults question me and i like that so it makes us 
think and reflect some of the things I followed from my dad just because he told me and that was very cumbersome for me. I followed just because my father said and my father followed just because his father said. So this culture that we have, the Indian culture or tradition needs to be looked at. Is it practical and pragmatic and relevant at this time? So now when the children and the youth in the name of modernization, in the name of liberty, when they ask and we challenge some of the cultures that we have, is it practical? Is it realistic? And the more we know about our Indian tradition and culture, for example, like yoga, like our Siddha, Ayurvedic medicine, so much to learn. And why is it not shared? I get this knowledge when I read through the books from the West. I get then I see, wow, my tradition so much to share, so much to learn. I picked up yoga after re, after re, uh, seeing the reading the book about yoga from the West. So in that aspect, then I when my children or the youth they represent the youth, and in the name of modernization, in the name of lib liberation, liberty. We are asking us to think and see what is good in our tradition. What is good we take and use. So much, so deep. And the more we know and embrace, we can become better. And the West has embraced our tradition. Why I say embrace and it, from the West, it comes back in a more sense and be relevant explanation. And when we say the West, wow, we read and we say, yes, yeah, so practical. Something that I've been doing when my parents were telling me some of the things, I just did it because of them and they can scientifically explain. So coming back, I embrace, I welcome the children to ask this question about our Indian culture and tradition. And if you ask me, my personal opinion is, our Indian culture and tradition is so vast, so beautiful, so majestic. It cannot be destroyed. It needs us to know more. And we should take this challenge by this youth asking us questions to know more about it and to share our culture, our tradition, which is so majestic. For example, I, when I see about Mahabharata and Ramayana, the stories that are there pales in comparison to the Avenger stories. And this should be shared in the modern technology from the modern perspective. And so the audience can know it better. So we can learn from the West how to make our Indian tradition and culture great. We are always great. The Indian culture and tradition is great. Only that it needs us to know more deeper in depth of it. Thank you for the opportunity. Over to you, uh, even Chair Joseph. Thank you, DJ Manohar. You know, rightly say, refer to the Mahabharata and Ramayana. What we see here is the discipline. Our tradition always goes by discipline. And every religious book also gives us how should we respect the elders and take blessing. For example, somebody passed a uh, test. He comes at uh, both dog, touches the feet of the father and says, Father, I passed in this test. That is the blessing that he receives from the father. So this kind of uh, tradition, the liberty and modernization, does not affect our culture because it is already written and followed in line with the genealogy of the each and every family. Now, the second question to those monsters saw, why have the youngsters started blindly following the Western culture? I don't really think that uh, that, uh, that the youngsters uh, anywhere, right, in India or anywhere else, uh, particularly the youngsters, they blindly follow uh, anyone. If you look at uh, the 
if you look at the revolution that's happening all the protests that's happening uh, people are, are actually questioning and challenging some some of the times uh, you know some of these protests may seem very unsettling so when this entire mandate of vaccination started or wearing masks started there were youngsters across the world who actually protested saying that we will not wear masks and we will not take in vaccines that's not something that i'm supporting but i'm seeing questioning the fundamental things which no one is taking anything as an as a you know as an answer uh, for good uh, nothing is blasphemy today to challenge and that's the mentality that i think um, that we have developed over the years so i i really don't agree that uh, youngsters are uh, are agreeing to everything and anything that's coming their way at face value people are questioning people are posing up resistance and that has been the spirit of the youngsters ever since um, for god know how many years most of the revolutions including the indian independence has been triggered by youngsters the politics of india has been defined by the youngsters right so uh, it's a different thing that today you'll only find 60 plus and 70 plus and 80 plus people making laws for the country but the fact is that this independence on which this constitution is built has been laid the foundation of that has been laid by the youngsters and they did challenge the status quo it is important for us to uh, appreciate the fact that some of these things that they are saying is may not look um, acceptable to us as on today but when we think deeper probably there is a lot of value in that what i would rather say is that what the youngsters are saying are, are, are doing nowadays is uh, somewhere they are failing to draw a line or understand the balance between experience and exposure somewhere i feel that there is a degree of arrogance that's coming in which is why 20 under 20 and 30 under 30 and 40 under 40 uh, takes a lot of credit like i mean you know people like bask in the glory of being on the list of 30 under 30 or 40 under 40 i don't see um, you know the 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 founder of kfc uh, getting any less credit for starting a business at the age of 65 and nothing we can take away from him on the other hand if you see um, in india the startups that we have the mortality rate is still at around uh 95 to 98% in most places which means that all the 20 of the 20 leaders they generally disappear in 20 months so uh it is important for us to keep that balance that yes exposure is important we are having breakthrough innovation but at the same time experience matters the kind of experience that you have for instance joseph sir or um, you know dtm brahma kumar or dtm uh, vida mano all of all of the panelists here as toast master it is possible that some people are doing certain things at a faster pace that does not mean that the exp- that the value of the experience goes down in fact if you go back and look at it you will see that people who are doing something successful today the base of that lies in what has happened before right so um, if you even if you look at um, you know look at if even if you look at my journey i always keep on saying that i learned so much from these three people sitting here dtm brahma kumar um, uh, joseph sir uh, dtm milind so uh, if i start discrediting them in my arrogance then that's me being stupid because it will take me much less time to fall from where i stand today than it took for me to reach where i have so i don't agree that anyone is discrediting anyone um, or but at the same time somewhere i feel that a sense of arrogance does come in and when it comes in then we have to keep a balance on it as a society and the arrogance is not Not only the youngsters, that sometimes they're in across age groups. Like if you see, if you look at Indians, uh, I'll again take the example of Bengalis. If you talk to a Bengali, the discussion always starts with Ramindranath Tagore and Satyajit Ray, and I take a lot of pride in them as well. I I have a full stack of library of books by Tagore and Ray, and I'm a very avid reader of Bengali uh, books. I read Beng I, I read mostly Bengali books. That's so that's why if someone asks uh, anything about English books, I'm stumped because you know I feel literature is very personal and Bengali is my language. so that's why i read in bengali mostly uh, uh, but that does not mean that i can keep on basking in the glory of the past i have to do something in the present right so um, that is something that we need to keep in mind that yes the past is important we can draw inspiration from the past we can be feeling proud of it but then that does not give us a right of arrogance that we come there from the nation of aryabhat we come from the nation of uh, vivekananda so we have got you know we can walk on water that that kind of a feeling should not come so it's not across it's not only the youngsters it's every one of us at some point of time we have been arrogant and that could be the start of the end thank you back to you toast master joseph thank you toast master sir it is true that technology has come to such an extent all over the world 
they are following. It doesn't make any difference whether where it starts, whether it's in the east or the west. Everyone has uh, following it in so, I will say diligently, that today we are able to send a rocket to the moon, which was not possible for a few years, few decades back. So the technology advancement is learned everywhere, irrespective of whether it is Indian culture or Russian culture. That is where we are in right. As far as the uh, youngsters going for other things like music or the dress or the, uh, the way in which they live, that may differ. Yes, that is still pretty the Indian culture, I would say. Now, the second question to DGM Ramakuma. Why the generation is fond of Russian culture? There's a fear of missing out. That's common everywhere. And they say when you're in Rome, be like the Romans. In Singapore, being a multi racial country, many of my son's friends are not Indians. So he tells me, how often do I get the chance to speak my mother tongue? Not often. So we need to accept that. Next, if you look at the heroes that are being promoted, who are the heroes that are being promoted nowadays in the mass media? It's Batman, Spider-Man, Superman. But if you ask any of the women here, whether it's Vinita from Nepal, Toastmaster Jayati from also West Bengal, or Toastmaster Sakuntala from Sri Lanka, who is their first hero? They'll tell you, it's my father. It's their father. That's Indian culture for you. That's Indian culture for you. And it also comes to the point that, in a way, we are not promoting our own heroes enough when we compare it to the Western movies. How many of us are actually promoting Rama, Sita? I'll come to that later in my, a later part. Next, if you look at the festivals that are being popularized nowadays, it's Mother's Day, Father's Day, and Valentine's Day. Okay, because there are still people who say, to me, every day is a Mother's Day, every day is a Father's Day, every day is a Valentine's Day. But then there are others like Halloween. That is far from Indian culture. But because we always watch it being commercialized and being promoted by the mass media, youngsters are following it. And in Singapore, there's something called Black Friday. It happens on a Friday. It's either on the 11th of the 11th month, meaning 11th of November, or 12th of the 12th month, 12th of December. And it becomes almost like a festival because people want to go and shop on that day. So what actually happens is that we follow what the mass media is teaching us. And what you put in the minds of people becomes... And let me just ask you, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, who discovered all these? Was all the Westerners. Why can't one of our Indians discover an app called Muniyama and then popularize it throughout the world? Would people go against it? Of course, they won't. They will follow it. So this innovation and technology is currently come from the Western side of the world, unfortunately to say that. So we need to catch up with them, not only Indians, but we Asians as a whole should come up with something that matches to that level and popularize it. And you can see through the popularity of songs like J-Ho, why it is colorary that there is an international global market for such things. When we started a Tamil Toastmaster Club in Singapore in 2001, it was the first, first one. The first question that many people ask You'll be surprised. Do you need to teach Indians how to talk? That was the first question that was asked. But today we have 14 over clubs in the Tamil language itself. And if you look globally throughout the whole world, there are Tamil clubs, Telugu clubs, Hindi clubs, and Malayalam clubs coming up. And Toastmaster International is also going to translate them into these languages. I'm a member of the Tamil Translation Review Committee as Toastmasters International. I consider it a privilege to be the only Singaporean to be there. But 
if we give a certain amount of presence and importance to our religion our culture and our heritage and our language definitely people will be there to give it the platform and the avenue like today we are able to speak on this topic because the speech viewers club members felt this is a topic that we should take by the horn and share panelists from malaysia singapore and india is when you create the demand there will be a supply so i will urge the youngsters like are they get an indian app call it muniyama if you want or manorama and popularize it the world will accept it i hand you back to the event chair those master joseph felix benedict again thank you sir thank you prema kumar Uspana University, under the patronage of Nate Nizam, he wanted to tra translate the entire engineering in Urdu. He spent a lot of money and time and people, but it failed. Why? Because the technology increases. He was not able to catch up. You will be going backward only in translating. You will not be able to publish also. You will not be able to teach also. You will not be able to teach also. So that is the situation as far as language is concerned. Sometimes it is a failure. Sometimes it is okay. But there is no such competition on language. But it is always a pleasant to hear any language on any function, on any tradition, on any stage, or even in the public. Now I come to a common question to all the three panelists. As we observed that the young generation of India attracted towards Western culture, so how can we attract them towards Indian culture? Anyone can take it. Can those sponsors also can you take it, please? Can you please repeat the question once? As we observe that the young generation of India attracted towards Western culture, so how we can attract them towards Indian culture? Postmaster Saurabh, apologies for interrupting. We actually only have around one minute on the clock, so I think you'll have to speed it up. For all the speakers put together, or for only yes, uh, we only have one minute left uh, for the panel discussion to end. So we have decided on a forty-minute mark for the panel discussion. So we are almost that way. So, Adarsh, I would like you to yeah, extend a bit because this is a very important question. All the three has to be spoken. Uh, you can give right. them uh, uh, each one. Uh, all right. In that case, I'll time every. To all of us. I'll time. I'll ta yeah. I'll give you two minutes each. Go ahead. So, um, so how do we attract them back? So the first question is, uh, why did they? Why did we lose them in the first place? Why did we have the brain drain? The brain drain did not happen because they did not like our culture. The brain drain happened because they found uh, better jobs there, better opportunities there. So if you really want the talent back, um, I don't think releasing uh, you know great Bollywood movies or making fantastic songs here or building a great culture here will bring anyone back. No one is going to leave their cushy job and come back because you had a great culture in India. If people are coming, uh, they need to come back. They need to come back uh, because of the reasons, because of which they left. We have to reverse those reasons. So we are providing them those kind of opportunities here. I'm not saying that we are not providing them, to be honest, because there are many more people who are in India who are building great careers there, who have refused uh, offers to move out, people who have uh, refused green card and come back to India because they thought that this is the place that they want to be. So everyone has their own priorities. We really want. Um, I I don't think that there is something that we really need to do to push anyone to come back. Uh, if, if we really create a kind of a country where people would want to love each other, stay with each other, then definitely why not? I mean, everyone would want to come back. Uh, and and when we go out, you know, we actually spread the positive culture, and the kind of culture we spread. And the kind of uh, the sense of society and self that we spread, that talks a lot about the brand India that we promote. If you go to Silicon Valley, you will see the kind of pride that people take when they introduce themselves as Indians. People really, literally, look up to them. I remember I was sitting in a bar and drinking, and someone said, "You are even Indian." I said, "Yeah." He said, "Oh, must we must be very rich?" I said, "Why?" He said, "You know, my landlord, he's an Indian. This entire place belongs to an Indian. Even the next one that belongs to an Indian. You guys are so rich, and you're so brainy, 
and imagine the two three drinks I had on him, and uh, you know he paid my rent just because I'm an Indian. So um, I I just had those free free drinks uh, thanks to all the Indian brothers who before me had worked hard in Silicon Valley <laughs> to build the brand India on which I engaged and had my own free drinks. So yeah, as long as we are spreading those good vibes and helping others get free drinks and free lunches for being just before becoming for being Indians, why not? But yeah, as long as we are spreading good vibes, I don't think we have similar stories everywhere. Uh, the image of Indians that we have built, uh, probably in countries some let's say like Thailand, is not that positive. You'll probably not have that kind of a warm welcome if, if people know that you're Indian. So it's all about how we are marketing ourselves, how we are showcasing ourselves to our activities, to our thoughts, actions. Again, I'll go back to the same thing: the sense of self and society that we are promoting. Thank you. Back to you, Joseph sir. Joseph sir, you have to unmute yourself. Joseph sir, you are not audible to all of us, so you have to unmute yourself. Joseph sir, you are not audible. Joseph sir, your mic. You have to unmute. Sorry. I think, in the interest of the time, the rest of the panelists should take the question one by one. Uh, I'll probably hand over to DTM uh, Brahma Kumar. Yeah. The question we're asking is, uh, how do you attract the youngsters towards Indian culture, right? One thing we can do is that we can revive our superheroes. The movie Bahubali is a good example of how the Indian superhero. Can be reached to other cultures across nations. When I was young, we used to read the Amar Chitra Kade, Kata. Nowadays, we have this thing called Chota Beam, and it's broadcast in Tamil in Singapore, and many kids are watching. So, when we create such superheroes stories for young children, they start to understand. Earlier, there was a question about the killing of school children in USA. You can relate it to our Indian culture and say, what does Indian culture say about killing people, the preciousness of life, and how it needs to be preserved? And you can add on, you know, what happens if they take a gun and kill someone and somebody else takes revenge, an eye for an eye will turn the whole world blind. The other thing that we can do is that we need to actively promote our Indian culture. I remember the great late director K. Balachan. In each of his movies, there will be a traditional art form. Come to recent times, in the movie Whisper Room, the Kathak dance was featured. So when we use the social medias, when those who are in the mass media use the social media to promote Indian culture and the good side of it, people will be attracted to it. All of us watch Korean dramas. Why? Because not because it's just because it's Korean, because there are universal values there, such as being loyal to someone, patriotism to the nation. These are also values found in our Indian culture. So if we can come with something similar and market it across the world, then more people would want to be interested to know. And finally, I would say that it's about time all of us start visiting our Indian heritage, like the Angkor Wat in Cambodia, the Pagan, Temple in Myanmar, the Borobudur in Indonesia, Bakkis in Malaysia, and the Sri Marian Temple in Singapore. And you will realize that how much of impact and influence Indian culture has had throughout the world. When I once spoke about Pongal in South African countries, sorry, in African country, they were so interested and amazed that we also have a harvest festival similar to them. So it's about creating an awareness, creating an interest and then making people want to learn and understand our culture. Many of you know that Bollywood movies are very popular. In Indonesia, there are people who are learning Indonesian, sorry, Hindi just to understand Bollywood movies. In Malaysia and Singapore, also it happens. So the same way we have this kind of approach, we can definitely attract the younger generation. They are the touch and they are the flame of the future. Back to you, event chair. Thank you, DJM Brahmakumar. Uh, DJ Manohar, you have anything to say on this one? Yes, thank you very much. First and foremost, I would like to emphasize here, when we talk about Indian culture and tradition, it doesn't belong to India alone. It belongs to the world. Why do I say this? The president of 
Indonesia, Djokovic was asked, who, which superhero would you choose to be if you are given a choice? In this era, in this modern era of Marvel characters, Avengers, DC characters, you know who you, he choose to convey his message? He say, I will choose to be like Lord Krishna in the Mahabharata. Why Lord Krishna? He says, Lord Krishna, he has powers. He has this Sudachana Chakra. He can do majestic things. He can fight. He's, he got, so he was talking about his, all these things. And then he said, more than all this, his wit, his ability to convey his message and in a smiling manner. So in that aspect, he was telling Lord Krishna. And for me, if you ask, how is our tradition? It is being revived by us now, talking here. And in the Mahabharata, Arjuna will ask Krishna, Krishna, will Dharma win? Can we win? Will righteousness prevail? Krishna's answer, which for me is my answer, is we don't have to worry about Dharma because in Indian culture and tradition is sanadana, is in depth. So the Krishna's answer is truth will always prevail. So it might be and it might be at this moment it, the Indian culture might not be so prevalent, but the time will come and we just watch. Thank you for this opportunity. Over to you, contest event chair Joseph. Thank you. I can conclude like this. As far as the educational part is concerned, we are always have to depend on one another. Whether it is East or three, two, one minute. Yes, three, two. One, let's go. Thank you, Alex. Now it is time for presenting what of thanks. I will call upon the person who is a distinguished Toastmaster awarded recently, three times president, past area director of selected distinguished area B2 club mentor, club coach, club sponsor, and has taken up almost all roles possible in Toastmaster. She has won the Grand Slam Master Mentor Award in the ninety two. I've had a great time. And by the way, we have actually gone over time. We have gone over time by mile, so to speak. I think if you can actually look at the clock, you'd actually notice we had gone, gone over time by at least 20 minutes or probably even more than that. So it goes to show how entertaining today's session has actually been. We had an excellent panel discussion on our uh, Indian culture, which I believe is going under the radar in recent times. And I think it was all brought back to life by three amazing speakers, Toastmasters, Saurabh Datta, DTM Brahma Kumar, and DTM Vira. It was an absolute pleasure to see all three of you in one room talking about the importance of the culture. Although we had this meeting in English, the, the card that disappeared at the right time, but the whole time, all I could actually do was listen to her. She posed a lot of questions. And she provided us seven important tips that can actually help us build an innovative speech. And I think I'm going to go back home, or I'm already at home, by the way. I'm just going to sit down and write down seven tips that I can actually use to make my speeches better. Regardless, thank you very much for joining. And I'd also like to provide a thank you to everybody else in this room, including the event chat, Toastmaster, Joseph, the Zoom master for today, who actually your knowledge is a role where you actually post questions you pick questions from the audience and you pose it to the Q&A moderator on the chat and the Q&A moderator will see to it that the questions are being asked. And it was also the job of the chat moderator to keep the chat alive. At the end of the day, as we're on Zoom, it's important that there's a level of engagement on the channel. And that's something that Postmaster Bidu was doing in the course of the meeting and that was just brilliant. I'd like to thank our DD and Menon, who was the Q&A moderator of today. He brought so much life. He posed amazing questions. That was very, very nice of him. And last but not least, I'd like to thank every guest in this room for being a
for the very uh, description of the water tank is really lovely. Uh, I would like to thank personally the keynote speaker Mahalia Jaisingi for instant acceptance of our request and making our meeting a great success. I also thank all the three panelists for the participant giving the great I adjourn that. Thank you. God bless you. Have a nice evening with your practice.